what if you could get really good grief support for just $3 a month? If you're navigating life after loss, but are a little tight in the money department, consider becoming a patron of Coming Back on Patreon. Listeners who support this podcast on Patreon receive weekly grief journaling prompts released every Monday morning and a once a month private grief hangout with me. If you're looking for an easy, inexpensive way to stay in touch with your grief, become a patron now at patreon.com slash Shelby Forsythia. Your monthly pledge helps me keep this podcast on the air and allows me to produce online courses, books, and very special grief experiences for grievers just like you. Get started now at patreon.com slash Shelby Forsythia. Thank you so much for listening. Hi there, and welcome to Coming Back, a podcast about coming back to life after death, divorce, diagnosis, and more. Today, I'm talking about feeling heard and understood with author Michael Sorensen. His book, I Hear You, totally changed the way I look at what it means to truly listen to another person. And while his work is helpful for all love and life relationships, we're specifically diving in through the lens of grief today. If you feel like family and friends are trying to fix you instead of being there for you, or you're feeling overwhelmed by listening to someone else's story, you're going to get a ton out of our conversation today. I'm Shelby Forsythia, an intuitive grief guide and author who speaks, writes, and teaches powerful truths on grief and loss. My mom's death in 2013 set me on the path to becoming a lifelong student of grief, and I use what I learned to create a world where grief is welcomed, normalized, and even embraced. Because even through grief, we are growing. Let's get started. Hi there, grief growers, and welcome to another episode of Coming Back. Thank you so very much for joining me here today. Uh, first things first, I want to let you know that I recently announced the dates for our Patreon live hangouts coming up in the year 2020. So if you've never heard of this before, once a month, I go live over on my Patreon page for supporters of this podcast and hold space for an hour to answer questions, to share stories about loved ones, and even to share things like frustrations or anxieties or the hard parts of grief, where there really isn't a place in the world where those things are talked about. So if you're interested in finding out those dates, head over to my Facebook page, to my Patreon page, to my Instagram, it's pretty much all over social media to find out what those dates are for 2020. And uh, and pledge on Patreon to support this podcast, because for just $3 a month, you can join in on these conversations with us once a month, as well well as unlock grief journaling, which happens weekly, and a ton of other bonuses that I don't share anywhere else only on Patreon. And that's at patreon.com slash Shelby for Scythia. And the reason I'm announcing it today is because our first live hangout is happening this coming Monday on January 27th at 7pm Central Time. So I would absolutely love to see you there. And I am honored as always to hold space for you, your grief and your story, along with this massive community of growing grief growers. Second thing today that I really wanted to touch on grief growers is that I need to make some changes to the structure of this podcast in order to continue doing the work that I'm doing. And before anybody panics, the podcast is still going to exist and it's still going to be interviews and conversations on life after loss. But the content within each episode is going to change just a smidge. And I wanted to let you know here as opposed to just abruptly changing it because I, A, I believe in full transparency. Um, but B, after going through grief and loss, I often find it's better to share the truth of what's happening and deliver all the information as you have it, as opposed to just changing something without warning and explanation. It, it builds trust and confidence and and a shared empathy between all of us here. So between me and you who are listening, as well as the community of grief growers that this whole podcast is really built to serve and built around. So some pretty big things are happening in my life and my world. I know if you've been listening to the show for a while, you know that I just released my very first online course called Life After Loss Academy. It's going extremely well. It's a 12 week intensive about life after loss and what it really takes to come back to that place. And because it's going so well, I'm getting ready to release a bunch of other grief courses online that you can take anytime. Uh, But those courses take time, energy and a lot of um just like focus, 
to produce. And because I'm starting to produce those things, it's taking attention away from really working on this show every single week as the show is happening. If you've been a longtime listener as well, you know, I've released my book permission to grieve in the last year. And you also know that I've been doing a lot of interviews and public appearances to get that out into the world as well and really help people who are feeling like they really need permission to grieve, but they aren't quite sure how to go about obtaining it. So coming back has existed for going on three years now, it was created in May of 2017. And we're getting ready to celebrate the third anniversary of coming back. And when I started the podcast, I wasn't doing anything else. The podcast was the thing that I did every now and then I would do a Facebook Live video or every now and then I would do an article. But now that this little grief business slash community slash revolution is growing into books and online courses and further study and greater communications and these online groups and the live hangouts and everything that I've compiled to serve those who are grieving the podcast is not taking a back seat so much, but it needs to be something that I can produce in advance and have ready for you every single week, as opposed to something that I jump on every single week and create literally the evening before it gets launched, because I want to update you on current happenings. I want to kind of tell you what's going on in my life. I want to teach you a little bit of something at the top of the show. Um, so what I'm really trying to say, what all this boils down into is that things are getting larger with Shelby for Scythia and with permission to grieve and with coming back. And because of that, the podcast needs to not necessarily get smaller, but get a little more neat and tidy, compact, less chatter at the top of the show and more into the deep conversations that make coming back what it is as a podcast. So going forward, expect to hear an opening at the top of the show where I announce what you're going to hear on the week's episode, as well as a little bit about me. And then as an, instead of going into something like the top of the show or a lesson for the week or an announcement about current events and happenings, I'm just going to deliver the interview your way, you're going to get longer time with our guests, I'm going to go more in the 40 to 50 minute realm as opposed to the 35 minute realm, which is kind of where I've been sitting in the past. And then you're going to hear an outro for the show, which is where the music comes back in, you'll hear a thank you to the guest, you'll hear all the new patrons that have uh, pledged to support coming back recently, as well as where you can find me and my work. But you will no longer hear kind of the real time updates of upcoming events and uh, the blog post that I just launched or the podcast that I was just featured on because I really want these conversations to be focused on who are we talking to? What are we talking about? And how can this help all of us as a larger community move forward into a space of how in the hell do I navigate life after loss? And that's really the core and the ethos of coming back conversations on life after loss. I've been doing a lot of twisty turniness over this guys, because for a while I was getting this hunch of like, Oh my God, should I end the podcast? Because it's getting so, um, it feels like one more thing to do on top of already producing everything I produce for grieving people. And it's not anything out of ungratitude, which I think a lot of you can resonate with. It's just really getting into this space of incapability or impossibility of like, I'm one human on the other side of this mic. And for as much as I want to produce, I can only do so much in 24 hours, in addition to taking care of myself and addressing my grief with my mom, and my other losses as well. So I really kind of had this reckoning over the holiday break of will coming back continue in the way that it has before. And at first, I thought that meant an ending, but the answer is no, a shift needs to happen. And so this direction towards intro music, interview, outro music, it's going to feel maybe a little more, more jagged at first and a little more impersonal. But I hope as we continue to go forward, you will recognize that this is my voice still on the end of the mic, I am choosing to have these conversations with people because I feel like they have something special to say for you and your grief. And the things that need to happen are still happening but the ways that they look and the formats in which they appear, especially here on the coming back podcast are going to change just a smidge. And I wanted to be totally transparent with you here and now because I know, from my own experience interacting with others in the grief space and just other podcasters in general, it really kind of sucks when things change and nobody says why. <laughs> so here's me kind of uh, concluding the family meeting <laughs> by saying, thank you so much for being here with me. The reason that coming back is changing is because there's more of you here, because you're asking more of me and because there's more that 
I feel in my soul, my spirit, my own grieving heart that I need to create on my behalf, on your behalf, on our behalf, on the world's behalf. And I'm just delighted to keep doing that with and for you. And I just need to change the format of how I work so I can, ten- so I can continue to stay nimble and stay open and stay the image I get is light on my feet so that the ideas that come to me, I can open my arms to them instead of saying, oh no, I'm busy because I've committed to this thing looking exactly this way. So no longer am I going to force myself to fit into the old container of coming back. Instead, I'm asking coming back to change as a container, which is really special and really cool. So if you have thoughts on this, if you have further ideas for what you'd like to see this podcast become, I'm always receptive to what you have to say. Shelby at shelbyforsythia.com is my email and I would love to hear from you there. You can also call the podcast hotline at 312-725-3043 and I will not pick up the phone, but you'd be glad to leave a message there. And I'll get back to you as soon as I possibly can. I think that was everything I have for you at the top of the show today, grief growers. I'm really, really tremendously excited to continue having these conversations with people who are radically changing what it means and what it looks like to grieve. Because I know that ultimately, at the end of the day, these conversations are what help us find our own direction, get the kind of support that we need, and cultivate the radical empathy that all of us need as we're navigating life after loss and coming back to a world that doesn't necessarily know how to welcome or embrace grief yet. And so, so much of my goal and so much of the work that I do here is creating a world and creating conversations where that exists. Your grief is welcome here. All right, let's get to the interview. Michael Sorensen is a marketer by day and a best-selling author, relationship coach, and personal development junkie by night. His book, I Hear You, the surprisingly simple skill behind extraordinary relationships, has helped thousands of people quickly resolve arguments, calm themselves and others, and truly make the people around them feel seen, heard, and cared for. You can find out more about Michael and his work at michaelssorensen.com. Grief Growers, I am so delighted to introduce you to Michael Sorensen, who wrote the book, I Hear You, because as soon as I read it, I knew the book wasn't about grief, but I knew it was pertinent to grief, because I think so many of us in the aftermath of loss are looking to be seen, heard, understood, comprehended before any action happens. And there's an incredible craving that I hear from all of you, especially when I uh, hear from you in emails or, or come to me as clients or things like that of like, I wish people in my life would just listen before they felt compelled to do anything. Uh, So Michael, welcome to the show and tell us a little bit about the inspiration for I Hear You and why it needed to be in the world as a book. Sure thing. Thanks for having me. And I'm excited to talk to you today and to talk to your audience because uh, I imagine most of your listeners, if not all of your listeners, are going to be saying, yes, oh my gosh, thank you. (laughs) I'm glad uh, we're talking about this. Because uh, my, my book, as you mentioned, is all centered around a concept known as validation. And validation essentially means helping somebody feel heard and understood. And like you just mentioned, Shelby, when we're going through a difficult time, when we're struggling with grief, that's what we need more than anything else, right? We, we need to feel heard. We need to f- feel appreciated and understood, not necessarily having, fix, having fixes thrown our way or assurance even thrown our way just yet. And so a, a little bit of background on me, I won't go too far into it so we can spend time on the, the meat of the conversation, but I actually learned about validation and all of these related principles through years of therapy. About 10, 10, years, 10 years ago or so, I started seeing a therapist to get help working through a number of different things in my life. And, and through all of that, I came away with a whole slew of valuable life and relationship skills that I I had no idea about prior to meeting with my therapist. And and one skill in particular was this concept of validation. And what was so funny to me is that as I was learning it, I started applying it. And I had experience after experience uh, of seeing just how powerful it was and really seeing how, how starved we are as a human race, you could say for validation. 
And I started trying to find ways to share it with my friends and my family and explain it. And they would say, well, what, what are you talking about? And I tried to find books and articles. And while I could find a few online, none of them really taught it in the way that I felt was most valuable and most applicable. And so long story short, I felt compelled to write that book myself, uh, self-published a couple of years ago, and it has been very well received. It's frankly very humbling to me and very exciting because now hundreds of thousands of people are grasping onto this as well and saying, yes, 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 this makes sense. This is one of the foundational elements of true connection. I love that because it's like I took something that I understood, but then it didn't exist on a wider scope. And so I just made it possible. I think that's that's the mission of so many authors. Uh, I know that you know that I've published a book called Permission to Grieve in the last year. And I kept having these conversations on permission. And I was like, why has nobody written a book about this? And I was like, I guess I will. <laughs> yeah, <nice. laughs> um, because it just com- kept coming up over and over again. And um, I want to talk about this notion of being starved for validation. And so I wonder if there are any signs or even like symptoms of somebody who's starved for validation, because I think a lot of the world, especially media tabloids or online social media spaces, see it as, oh, they're just seeking attention. And I kind of wonder if you have any insight as to what being starved looks like, like, oh, this is a, what you would call a bid for attention right now. Sure, sure. So I I talked, Shelby, as you'll remember early on in my book about an experience where I was speaking with a woman who was grieving. She was going through uh, a difficult period of loss for her. It was the divorce of her parents, uh, though her, she had also just found out that her brother was diagnosed with cancer. And I think it was a week or two prior, both she and her mom had been in a pretty serious car accident. And and I was speaking with her. This was a casual first date. <laughs> and uh, you know, I didn't expect to get into anything deep per se. <laughs> As um, you usually do not on first right. dates, but then it happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell me about your life story. What are you dealing with right now? You know, that's not where I was going with it. And, uh, and yet she was so closed off as we were talking and I couldn't figure out what was going on, but she would give me these short one word answers. And, uh, and basically I just thought, well, she's not into me. Okay. I misread the situation. I'll take her home. And I ended up asking her a question about her family. And that's where she indicated that it was a sensitive subject. And then I could tell that there was something deeper at play here. It wasn't necessarily about me. And I, I gently pressed and she said, well, my parents are in the middle of a divorce. And I thought, uh, oh, there you go. And, and I said, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. And she said, oh, it's okay. It's fine. You know, and, and she just brushed it off. She put on a pretty unconvincing tough girl face. And, and this is where Shelby, to answer your question directly, signs that people are starved of validation. In this particular instance, she was closing herself off. She was no longer willing to be vulnerable with people because everybody she talked to tried to fix it. Everybody she talked to tried to give her advice or assurance instead of just listening to her and letting her just vent and complain and just talk. And ultimately that's what I was able to give to her at that and and, and that evening. And we spent the next couple of hours talking about it because to her response of, oh, it's fine. It's not that big of a deal. I said, no, that's got to be incredibly difficult. I, I, I can't even imagine what you're going through. And then she opened up and she said, yeah, actually, it really sucks. And then she started going on explaining to me how invalidated she felt by all these people. So the signs are all over the place for people who are in tune emotionally. When you're talking with somebody, most of the time people will offer one little bit of vulnerability. One little bid for connection, like you said, drawing on John Gottman's research, to basically say, I want to share something, but am I safe to do so with you? And when we recognize that, and when we are able to respond with validation instead of advice or assurance, that opens the door to deep and lasting connection. This was one of my favorite stories from your book, because I'm like, of course, this would happen on a first date. Um, (laughs) But then also, it's it's something that's so similar in talking about life with grief because for so many people, this pain or this need to be seen and heard on an emotional level is literally just below the surface. And people are constantly, I get this image of um, like a fly fisherman casting a lure. People are constantly casting to see, is it safe here? Can I fish in these waters? Are people going to respond in an emotional way or are they just going to try and fix me? And it's it's really tricky to tell if you don't know 
the language that people use to try and get a bid for attention. And so I know in my world, uh, people will say the default of, hi, how are you? Or hi, how's it going? And I've had to teach myself to say, uh, it's okay, but I'm struggling with X, Y, Z right now. And for me, that's a, a bid for connection or a bid for attention. And if they yeah. respond in a positive way or um, tell me more about that or something like that, I'm like, okay, now it's safe to continue. But for people who are um, p- people who don't respond well, or that's really tough, your assignment for today is X, Y, Z. And they kind of just brushed across and move on. I'm like, okay, not a safe place moving on. Um, and I wonder, and this might be a, a tricky or a tough question to ask for you. How can we seek out people who are safe for us? And, or is there a way for us as the seekers of connection to get people to understand us better without feeling shut down? Because I feel so much in the aftermath of loss, we look for validation emotionally from friends and family and all of a sudden in loss they're not really able to provide it where it seems like they either used to before or we just thought they were good at it and then all of a sudden it's like those skills vanished or we're realizing that they never really existed and so we keep seeking connection and validation from people who just aren't good at it and i wonder if there's a way to to speak to friends and family and tell them hey you're not listening without physically having to shake them right Right. It's a, it's a tricky question. It's a tricky situation because it's very situation dependent. And, you know, in general though, and I talk about this in my book, there is a lot of value in teaching people about validation. So one of the trickiest things that we often face is that we, as the grievers, we, as the seekers of validation, aren't often aware that that's what we're wanting. And so I I think back often to my childhood, I had moments when yeah, I, I think, speaking frankly, I wonder why I was so comfortable confiding in my mother, but not so much in my father. And I love them oh, both. They both sure. love me. There was no question. And yet, as I started going to therapy and I started looking at validation and everything, I realized, oh my gosh, it's because my mom was naturally a better validator. She would withhold advice and she would withhold the assurance and she would listen to me first and show that she understood and help me not feel crazy for feeling whatever it was that I was feeling. And my father, on the flip side, uh, does what, frankly, I still tend to do, which is try to fix it right away. And again, it's coming out of a place of love. And yet he didn't realize that in that moment, I was getting frustrated. And, And the funny thing is, I didn't know why I was getting frustrated. I would get defensive, you know, so I'd come to him complaining or venting or wanting validation, though I didn't know it by name at the time. And he saw it as a request for advice. And so, you know, in his mind, well, why else would he be coming to me if he didn't want a solution to the problem? So he tries to give me a solution. I start getting defensive, right? Because I'm not feeling heard. Instead, I'm feeling like I'm trying to be fixed. And so I start pushing back. And so, and then he starts getting upset or frustrated because he's like, why are you so ungrateful? I'm trying to help you. Why are you here? And we do this little dance back and forth. And so when we ourselves, it starts with us, first putting a word to it and going, okay, that is what I want right now. I want validation. So now as I'm approaching my sibling or my friend or my parent and I, I start talking with them and they start shooting back with advice, depending on your relationship, I really recommend having a candid conversation with them and educating them. Uh, It's difficult in the moment sometimes. So again, in a perfect world, they will have learned about it already. Uh, They, this is not a, a shameless plug for my book, but I wrote the book so people would become familiar with it, right? So in certain instances say, hey, (laughs) you know, I've been reading this book and it's really helping me understand myself. It would mean a lot to me if you would skim it, you know, or if you would, you know, read some articles online about this because I'm realizing that's what I need in this moment. And most people, if they care about you, they're open to that. And they go, oh, well, I want to help you. So what is this you're talking? Oh, okay, validation. Oh, okay, interesting. And hopefully they can start to learn how to support you in that way. One of my favorite images online is of a, it's either a tweet or a screenshot from Tumblr or something that gets circulated again and again over social media platforms. And it's this, uh, it's this man who's learned, he's like, I've learned to ask my wife if she wants advice or if she just wants me to listen. And it's totally changed my life. And I think that's a really short, succinct synopsis of like, here's, I hear you in one tweet or or one post or whatever. (laughs) And I drew this little picture. A lot of my listeners know I take notes as I'm interviewing guests. And I drew this picture of like two little Sims, 
standing next to each other if you've ever played this computer game and one has a speech bubble that says bid for connection and so it's the complaint or the vent or the problem or the grief that they're experiencing and then the other one who's opposite them has four options so it's like in gameplay you can choose one of four answers to this you can choose to ignore it you can choose to offer advice you can choose to parrot it back exactly or you can validate um and i think all of those each have their own set of consequences, but the only one that makes people truly feel heard is that validation of which you speak. I love that. I, I love that image. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I just literally doodled that while you're talking because this other chapter of your book was another of my favorites because I think a lot of, especially entrepreneurial spaces and therapy spaces and counseling spaces talk about parroting. And so in order to show you understand somebody, you literally say what they said back to them, but there's something missing in there and that there's not like an emotional comprehension. And so when you were like, just to be clear, validation is not parroting, that totally blew up in my world. Cause I'm like, everything I see everywhere just says, oh, I'm so sorry that you're angry. When somebody says, I'm angry, I'm so sorry that you're angry. I'm like, you literally just said what I said back to me now. Who's, <laughs> who's saying what to who? I feel like I'm talking to myself. Um, and so it doesn't feel like a conversation. That was one of my favorite parts of your book. So can you speak more on the difference between parroting and true emotional validation? Absolutely. Uh, your listeners might also have it heard as reflective listening you know, is, is another term for that. And it's exactly that. It's it's repeating back what the other person just said to you. And it has value in it. And it's widely taught in business trainings, you know, in the corporate circles as a way to improve your listening. The issue is with it is exactly what you just identified, Shelby, is that it feels mechanical. It, it can come across as inauthentic because when I say, gee, I'm so frustrated because uh, this coworker won't leave me alone. And the person I'm talking to says, oh, so I hear that you're frustrated because your coworker won't leave you alone. And I'm like, well, yes, but <laughs> like, okay, you're listening. Thank you. Like, I recognize that now, but <laughs> that's not what I wanted, you know? It's like to hear your voicemail again, <laughs> press four. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> and so that, that is one point that I drive home in, in my book and in my teaching is that most people don't question whether or not we comprehend the words we say. They want to know that we understand the emotion that they're feeling. And that to me is the ultimate difference between reflective listening and validation. It's that reflective listening just shows them, yeah, okay, hear the words you're saying, makes sense. Validation requires empathy. It requires that you identify and connect with an emotion, and then you offer justification for feeling that emotion. So instead of saying, I understand that your coworker is upsetting you, you say, oh my gosh, that would drive me crazy. And that satisfies those two requirements for validation. One, you identified the frustration, and two, you offered some form of justification, which in this case is simply you saying, oh my gosh, I would feel the same way. That is validating. Yes. And I know a lot of people struggle with grief because they're like, well, I've never felt this intensity of grief before, so how can I possibly emotionally relate? And in my brain, I try to kind of think of emotions like a color wheel where like the total opposites of each other are, are joy and despair, but then despair has a lot of neighbors next to it, sadness, depression, being upset, feeling perturbed, and then joy has happiness, elation, whatever. And so there's kind of this full wheel spectrum of emotions. And so if somebody says, you know, my coworker's bugging me, they won't leave me alone. I'm like, okay, I'm not quite sure what, I know what bugging by a coworker feels like, but just for the sake of example, I'm like, I know what being bugged kind of feels like, but the closest thing for me is annoying or being driven crazy or something like that. And so I can say something similar back, like, oh my God, that would drive me crazy. Or, oh my God, that sounds so annoying. And that's almost like, um, you get to check your work. You get to double check. I'm like, right. just to clarify, this is the emotion you're telling me, right? And then they can come back and be like, well, it's not so much annoying as it is distracting. And then that conversation can continue in that direction. Exactly. exactly. And, and I love that you pointed out instances where you can't relate because uh, we're all going to run into that, right? Again, if we're, going, if we're de dealing with a very heavy situation, chances are good. Very few people we talk to are going to have felt similarly. And so- so if we flip the tables and if you're that person trying to comfort and trying to validate somebody, I suggest doing exactly what you just said there, which is giving it your best effort, you know, almost guessing at the emotions. And so I, if you ha can't relate, I strongly recommend admitting that because some people are afraid to do that, thinking that it's going to come across as unhelpful. 
In my experience, it's the polar opposite. It's very validating because it shows respect to the other person. And so Shelby, you know, if you're dealing with the death of a loved one, and I clearly cannot relate exactly to how you feel because I'm not in your head, I can say, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm so sorry. You know, pause for a little bit and say, I honestly cannot even imagine what you're going through. And that right there is validating. And then as throughout the conversation, we can do what you suggested, which is say, I mean, are you, are you feeling scared, you know, upset, like distraught, you know, throw out some examples there. And then like you said, then they'll take that and they'll, they'll run with it. They'll correct you. And they'll say, no, I'm actually feeling, you know, terrified. And then that gives you more to work with through the conversation and helps you better connect with them. Yeah. And this actually opens the doorway to a different conversation that floats around the grief space. And I don't know if you're familiar with this, Michael, but there's a conversation. It's kind of 50-50. Some people are really okay with the phrase, I can't imagine what you're going through because it acknowledges, yeah, you really can't. Um, And then there's another group of people, and I don't know which side of the fence I sit on, which is why I bring up this conversation. There's another group of people who are almost upset by or offended by, I can't imagine what you're going through because it feels like a distancer. Like, I already know you can't relate to what I'm going through, but now you've said it. And so it, it feels like um, a further way to disconnect from now you really can't empathize with my experience. And so I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but it's something that's been revolving around in the space. Sure. Well, to me, it all comes down to the way in which you say it. You know, experts estimate that as much as 70% of our communication is nonverbal, meaning it's body language, it's tone of voice, it's our facial expressions. And so when we say... You, know, you could say the exact same thing and you could say, gee, I don't even, I can't even relate to that. It can feel a little dismissive and distancing, like you said. If you say, oh my gosh, I, I cannot even imagine, it comes across as much more respectful and, and almost reverent to their struggle and their, and their circumstance. And so, at least in my experience and in the experience of those that I work with, I find that it's quite validating because more often than not, people say, oh my gosh, I know exactly how you feel. Uh, or, you know, here's really what you should do, right? And they start to go into those invalidating statements. And that's very off-putting. That's very disrespectful because we never know exactly what someone's going through. Yeah. And I'm I think like we- I'm nodding my head right now. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, no one really knows, do they? <laughs> yeah. And so if you, if you say that, and again, you do it in a sincere, respectful tone, I believe they will take it with a lot of gratitude because because most people are expecting you to invalidate them. And so when you instead turn it on its head and you say, respect to you, hats off to you, I'm here for you. And yet I respect that I don't know exactly what you're going through. That's quite connecting and quite validating. That's really beautiful. And thank you for giving us, I mean, you literally just laid out some scripts there that people can use. And that tip of, you know, saying it in a sincere fashion, whether it's in person or over the phone, that tone of voice really helps drive that point home. I know for me in my work, because the divide is so great and I never really know with my clients, I'll say something like, um, like, you know, that isn't my story or my experience, but I imagine that this is hell for you or like whatever emotion they literally just put onto me. I'll kind of try and reflect back in a way. And, um, and it's a different way of saying, I can't imagine what you're going through, but it more acknowledges that I can't possibly walk in your shoes or I can't possibly be standing in the same place that you are, but here's as close as I can get. And there's, there's also a sincerity in that. And it made me immediately jump to how do you approach validation on social media or on online spaces where people cannot hear tone of voice? They can't see your eyeballs. They don't really know what you're doing while you're texting on your phone or putting something on Facebook of RIP or can't imagine what you're going through. So sorry, whatever. Uh, on your posts online, because I know, especially in our digital age, so many more of us, A, are getting grief support online, which is great. And as a majority of the work that I do, but B, we're offering grief support online. And so we're trying to be validating humans when we can't physically be next to each other. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I have a love hate relationship with social media. (laughs) I, my, my background's in marketing. So I love it from a marketer standpoint. I really don't like it from a personal standpoint, above and beyond the obvious ways of staying connected to people. But that when I use the word connected uh, loosely there, because as I'm sure you know, I'm sure your listeners know, it's tough to really connect with people over a digital platform only. So that you can keep the 
you can keep the uh, logistical connections there, so to speak, and you can keep up to date on what's going on. If somebody posts something very difficult or a struggle, or they're you, they're clearly reaching out for help, I'm of the opinion that giving them a call uh, is going to be the nicest thing you could do, or finding a way to connect with them. Again, not not every situation is going to warrant that. Not every situation is that going to be appropriate. But I think it is difficult to offer real sincere. I shouldn't say it that way. Of course, you can be sincere. I think validation, assurance, even sympathy stops a bit short when you can't have a true human to human connection, when it's just text you're typing. Because like you said, you can only control so much with certain emojis and italics and asterisks, the emotion that you're trying to convey. Beyond that, you have to have vocal communication. You have to have face to face. Sometimes you have to have physical touch to really have that deeper connection there. Yeah. The phrase that just came to me was there's a life force that's missing. And that's why I do um, so much here with podcasting because the sound of my voice is different than just seeing the words I type on a screen. But then also it's why I transfer to video as well. I'm like, here's my face. This is as close as we're possibly going to get, but it's live. It's happening right now. And we're all together. Um, And uh, especially grief support around the world, that's about as close as you can get. But literally nothing has compared to, and I will never forget memories that I've made in in person grief support courses where the, there are other people who are crying, breathing, reaching for Kleenex, hugging each other. Like it's just a different life force that lives in those spaces, which is, I, I'm glad you touched on that. Thank you. Cause I was like, I'm going to bat this question out because validation <laughs> on social is hard because we can all have the scripts, but it is that emotion that's kind of, uh, it, go, it goes to crickets a little bit. Right, right. Well, and, and, and I deal with that from time to time. And I post somewhat regularly on my blog articles, diving deeper into validation and different scenarios and situations. And of course, I provide dialogue and some examples and scenarios. And I do my best. And yet inevitably, I get an email or a comment saying, this is horrible. This is so disrespectful. And I go back and I read through and I say, oh, that's because they're reading it this way, <laughs> right? Not mm-hmm. this way. Mm-hmm. And, and I, it's difficult. And so I I love what you, how you refer to that as that life force, that connection, that energy. And and even over the phone, like you said, you don't always have to be in person, but there is something even just to the tone of our voice and just to the real time communication there that that takes it 10 times farther than simple text on screen. Now, this might be a hot button question um, because I sense and I feel like a lot of, a lot of the world believes in this myth that taking time to truly listen, slow down, validate, take the bid for attention and give it your full attention, uh, takes a lot more energy and focus than if you just operate by, hey, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Um, So do you ever run into like an emotional burnout or exhaustion or an inability to listen? And or do you ever feel burdened by, I am receiving too many bids for attention? Or connection. Absolutely. And I love that you asked the question because it's one that I'm getting more and more often and starting to address more because it, it can be taxing. Not always. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of authenticity, you know, and sincere empathy when we're talking to people. And yet it's difficult if we're always taking on other people's burdens. And so I'm a big proponent of boundaries and and of recognizing codependency. So if, if any of you, you listeners are not familiar with codependency, I strongly recommend you do some research on that. There's articles on my website or Google will bring up millions for you to read more about. And then boundary setting. And so if you are the person comforting or trying to help somebody going through a difficult time, you do have the right to carve out some space for yourself. And, and you can do that very kindly, very respectfully. Um, in fact, uh, the next podcast episode that I'll be posting is how to deal with people who are constantly complaining. Because while there is a time and a, a space for validating people and per, for providing them that room to grieve, sometimes there comes a point when they've had the proper time, you've given them all the validation you can, and they are choosing to stay and wallow in despair rather than taking control and responsibility rather for their own happiness and starting to take action. And so it, it's a very situation specific uh, answer, I suppose, Shelby, uh, to boil it down to a short, simple answer. 
yes, there are absolutely times when just those short transactional conversations make most sense. You know, if you're just walking in between meetings, talking to a coworker, hey, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. Well, good to see you. And you're gone. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, there are going to be times when you want to have a deeper conversation. And then there are going to be times when you need to set some boundaries and say, listen, I would love to talk more. I'm, I would be distracted right now if, if we tried. Can we talk tomorrow? Or if you take it one step further, again, this is a can of worms we can talk about later, uh, setting some boundaries and saying, listen, I want to be there for you. I want to help you. And I'm feeling like I'm the venting box here. Can you help me, you know, can you help me understand what more I can do? Or what are you going to do to get out of this situation? It's difficult conversation, but one that absolutely can and ought to be had to ensure that both parties are, are feeling full and energetic and connected. I am so glad you said that because the first thing that jumped to my mind when you started talking about uh, people who perpetually complain or do nothing but vent or, or grievers who've had their time and space and then continue to choose to stay and wallow, I'm like, usually that's not the case. But what's actually happening is they're so thirsty and they found the person that's going to validate for them that they just put everything into one human because they're like, nobody in my life validates me. So this is going to be my person. And then that person, poor thing, is the <laughs> container for all of their emotional dumping ground as opposed to somebody else who's trained at this, like a, like a listening therapist or like a grief professional or somebody else who can also take some of that, um, not necessarily burden, but just like dump out some of that container so it can be shared more in a space as opposed to somebody's receiving the onslaught of all of my grief. Um, but I remember being in that place and I remember being that starved for validation. I think I had two people in the first six months that after my mom died where I was like, you guys are my people and your phone's going to ring off the hook and that's just the way it's going to be. <laughs> and, um, and lucky for me, I was in a place where they did not push back on that at all. But then there were these places where I started pulling back and I started going to grief support groups and I started finding communities online where I was like, okay, there's more space for this than I thought there was. And so they received less and less and less of my uh, my bids for connection. Um, and so I think that's a bit of what people who are trying to support grievers experience is like, wow, I think I'm the only person that you're talking to. <laughs> and that's, that's another conversation worth having. And yes, you're right that it can be a can of worms of like, wow, I'm feeling like this is a lot, but I, I kind of like how you turn it around of like, how can you enlist the grieving person to help you come up with a solution as opposed to just setting an ultimatum and shoving the door in their face, which is extremely hard for right. somebody who is already grieving to feel another loss in the form of a friend who disappears. Um, so I love this notion of a person supporting a grieving person being like, hey, I'm feeling overwhelmed. How can you help me not feel so much and or maybe can I help you find somebody else to talk to? Is there another space that we can find support for you or um, is it okay if I step away for like 24 hours and then I reach out to you again on Sunday? And I love this idea too of like, I can't talk right now. Can we talk tomorrow? Um, because it reassures people that you, that you give a shit, frankly, about right. what they're going through. Um, and that leads me to my next question is what happens or how do we continue to validate people if we kind of fucked up the first time? Like if we did not do a job, a good job and we really either offended somebody or hurt their feelings or, or slam that door in their face. Sure. Well, it's kind of a funny question because the solution is to validate the fact that you messed up <laughs> and <laughs> yes. to acknowledge what they're likely feeling, you know, <laughs> and, and I still do it. You know, it's funny because I here, I wrote the book on validation and yet I'm still hyper conscious or hyper aware of the fact that I am not always great at validating. In fact, just, just the other week I was talking to my wife and well, she was talking to me and she was complaining about something at work. And what did I do? I gave her advice and I tried to help her fix it. Cause to me in my mind, I'm like, this is easy. I'm like, well, you should just do this. And she's like, no, da, 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 da. well, how about you try that? Well, no. And then to her credit, she said, Michael, I just want you to validate me. <laughs> and I thought, Oh, that's embarrassing. <laughs> like, she knows your lingo she and knows, she can use yeah. it against you. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, you know, in that moment and in subsequent moments, I said, you're right. I'm sorry. You know, that, that's frustrating. And, I, you know, I kind of laughed it off like I'm doing here. Of, Isn't that ironic? And yet I've had multiple instances of that where I go back to somebody and I say, listen, I, I recognize that I wasn't very validating the last time we talked. I'm sorry for jumping into advice. Nobody likes unsolicited advice. Um, can we talk more about it? And every time 
the person's eyes usually get, well, typically they, their eyes get a little big going, whoa, that's odd. I've never had somebody come back to me and acknowledge that, <laughs> that that's what happened. But then B, they're grateful and they're excited to talk and, and we can open up that dialogue more. Yes. Yeah. And I love that you phrased it that way. And again, gave us those scripts. Thank you. This whole podcast, guys, I hope you're taking notes if you're not driving, but like, holy crap, this is just full of, if you're not sure what to say, here's a good place to start. And again, I'm thinking about turning the tables too, because a lot of times as a grieving person, I know that I disappeared. I dropped the ball. I was not a very good friend while I was grieving. And and these are kind of things that because of the immense blinders that grief puts onto our faces when we're grieving. It's like, I can only focus on staying alive right now. But as I emerged from being in those that place of acute grieving, I kind of looked around. I was like, oh, I've been a bad friend. And so I reached out to people uh, probably a year, even two years after my mom died. And I was like, hey, I know I fell off the grid and I had every reason to fall off the grid. Um, but I really care about what's happened to you in the time since. Can we schedule time to catch up? And they would always be so surprised if like, wow, I thought you were gone forever. And so this sense of somebody's caring enough to, to reopen the door is really important. And I did have some people be like, it's, it's been a little too long. And they didn't say it this way, but we were kind of okay with things tapering off or petering out because they were, they needed to be done. But other people were like, yes, I'd love to pick up where we left off and then got to re-engage with the relationship. Um, but it's just really amazing what happens when we, when we have the vulnerability to to open that door again. So I guess that's the next place I want to go that just popped into my brain. What do we do if we're scared to validate somebody or scared to open that conversation? Maybe some logical tips for like why validating is a better idea than just either not doing anything or giving advice. Um, and yeah, maybe some tips for that. Sure. Sure. So, so I like to look at validation as a tool. Maybe that sounds a bit detached. I don't mean it that way. It's a tool for genuine connection. So it's, of course, not a way to manipulate somebody. It's not a way to control somebody. It's not a way to, quote unquote, make them feel better. It's a way to show that you hear them and that you appreciate and you respect them. And so one of the, well, the number one question I get whenever I do this in corporate trainings or one-on-one -on -one or what have you is, well, I don't want to validate somebody if I don't agree with them. Oh. You know, so if, some, if somebody's grieving mm -hmm. and, it, it, and maybe they're saying, you know, my mom never loved me anyway, and my life's horrible, and you know, whatever it is, I'm shooting stuff out, but whatever it is, if they disagree with how that person's seeing things, then they think, well, I can't validate because validating is agreeing, right? And it's not. And that's the number one key takeaway that I, I try to drive home with people is the validation simply means I understand where you're coming from. It doesn't mean I agree with how you're seeing things. And, and I give plenty of examples in my book and on my website for sake of time, I won't get into them here. But um, if you're feeling resent or, uh, resistant to validating somebody because you don't agree, recognize that that's not what you're doing. In fact, if you disagree with someone and if you want to help them see a different point of view, validating is your best friend because until they hear heard and understood, they will not hear or understand you. And so when you validate them and you say, that's super difficult. I, I, of course you'd feel that way, especially if he didn't even come back and apologize to you after they, they go, Oh, okay. She understands me. He understands me. Then you can follow up and say, and I do have a few thoughts on the matter. Do you mind if I share? And then, and then that gives them a chance to ask for that feedback or that advice. And they are much, much more open to hearing that. So if you're feeling resistant for that reason, Look at it as, in fact, a tool to help you offer a different bit of insight or, or direction to the person you're talking with. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, too, I think the fear is, oh, my God, I have to bear my entire heart all at once. And I'm like, no, you can do this in really, really baby steps. And it's more about listening than it is pouring or giving of yourself, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and like I said, it can all be boundaried. And it's, it's trickier to set those boundaries. Because again, like, like you said, Shelby, one thing we don't want to do is make them feel like we're not pulling away or that we're done talking to them. But there are tactful ways to do that, even down to just simply validating first, sincerely, and then asking more questions. For example, what, what are you going to do about it? Or, you know, or, or what are you thinking? Or most of the conversation, like you said, Shelby, is on them. 
because they need they just need a listening ear. They need somebody to allow them that space and that respect to share what's on their heart. And the more we give of that, they naturally heal it. Nine times out of 10, people figure things out on their own, you know, or they end up looking to find more professional help. And that's the gift that we give them. It's not always the solution. It's simply allowing them the space to process the emotions that they're feeling. I literally just had this phrase jump into my brain. I don't need to be the solution. I just need to be the space. Love that. Yeah. Isn't that Love cool? That. Yeah, that's really good. <laughs> really good. I'm going to write that one down. Good. Please do. Oh my gosh. This has just been so cool. And I want to know, um, Michael, if there's anywhere that you would like to be found, please share your work with us, your book with us, and any other place online or offline that you do amazing work on validation in the world. Absolutely. Best place to connect with me or find me is on my website, michaelssorensen.com. Uh, you'll find my articles on there, links to my work. Uh, I do have a podcast as well, the I Hear You podcast, which is, of course, available wherever podcasts are. Uh, and, and I would love to hear from listeners. If you guys have other questions or other things that I haven't explained to your satisfaction or want to dive deeper on, please feel free to find me on social media or contact me through my website. Grief Growers, this was just an amazing conversation on if you're on the grieving side or if you're on the receiving side of grief as well. So thank you so much, Michael, for joining us on Coming Back. And I'm just so honored to say I hear you. Thank you, Shelby. Appreciate the opportunity. So that's all for this episode of Coming Back. Thank you so very much to Michael Sorensen for joining us on Coming Back to talk about emotional validation and how truly listening is crucial when we're going through hard times. You can find Michael's book, I Hear You, as well as more information about his courses and coaching at michaelssorensen.com. And you can always find that link in the show notes. If you'd like to get online grief support for just $3 a month, pledge to support this podcast on Patreon at patreon.com slash Shelby Forsythia. You will instantly unlock access to weekly grief journaling prompts and monthly live grief support calls with me. Our next call is happening January 27th at 7 p.m. Central Time. Thank you so much this week to Sophie and Penny, who are now supporting this podcast every month on Patreon. I so, so appreciate you. If you liked what you heard today, subscribe to Coming Back on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and tell a friend about Coming Back, because you never know what someone you love is going through. Thank you so much to Addie Goldstein, who composed our theme music. You can find me on Facebook at Shelby Forsythia Intuitive Grief Guide, Instagram at Shelby Forsythia, or simply shelbyforsythia.com. If you'd like to leave a question or comment for a future show, email me at shelby at shelbyforsythia.com. As always, my dear grief growers, it was beautiful sharing this space and time with you today. I see you, I'm proud of you and the work that you're doing in the world, and I love you. Because even through grief, we are growing. books about how grief changes us, but what about how grief changes our friendships? I'm working on a new book right now about how grief impacts our closest, longest, and most intimate relationships with others. If you'd like to share a story about how grief has changed your friendship, made it more awkward, or ended it entirely, please head to shelbyforsythia.com slash friends to fill out a submission form. You might just have your story published in my next book, All About Grief and Friendships. Once again, that link is shelbyforsythia.com slash friends with an S. Thank you so very much in advance for allowing me to read, witness, and learn from your stories on grief and friendship.